So some of my points I will give here uh, in my talk about tools and techniques of game localization will be a kind of summary of what we already heard today. But in, in my second part, I would like to invite you to um, look at um, the files, the data, um, which has been published for the beta um, test, Karin also mentioned earlier this afternoon, uh, to prepare you to, yes, to have all the technical um, tools and knowledge you need to do the localization in a few months. So, um, what we already heard, so video games are audiovisual products, so you have to do with the translation of oral and of dialogic texts. Um, so we heard, especially uh, when Karin was talking about dialogue writing for dubbing or lip sync, she, uh, subtitling is as well uh, something one has to do with. And a big part is the translation of narrative text. And this is really different from technical text, from um, pure UI elements. So. Um, there you get either the information about the game world and its characters, um, but in a kind or in this kind of software in the game you have um, as well functional text. So we have both types of text in those um, uh, applications. And um, finally, so uh, you have a good mix of everything, but the creative one is certainly the one which is predominant here. So in game localization, you have um, or game localization differs from localization of other software products because of this kind of special text. So they require a, a particular kind of translation. Um, different areas of knowledge, so we heard about fantasy, but uh, history is as well an application field. Um, you have to know something about a special or a specific historic period in some um, games. And uh, often you have as well to do with the popular culture, so the variety of linguistic fields is rather huge. Therefore, the challenges are obvious, so you um, have to be creative and uh, a lot of work is done um, by teams, so you are not a single translator working for yourself. You have to um, share your knowledge and um, your discussion with others. Um, what we heard from Martina and Isabel, there are, are situations where we have long working days because one of um, the um, things in uh, localization and for many other um, software products is the simultaneous shipment and therefore a product has to be finished. And um, what we heard as well, sometimes or perhaps uh, often you have to do the translation without the game itself so you don't have really an idea uh, of what it looks like if it is uh, published. The problem on the linguistic side is not only that you don't have an idea or can, can't imagine um, the graphics but um, sometimes the, the context or the context in which you work is missing and this demands a certain creativity and um, in many fields, what we heard from Karine, it's only the tester which uh, finally um, recognizes that there is something which doesn't fit into your game. So, I already mentioned the variety of textual types and um, it's not up to you to decide whether a certain linguistic style is okay or not because in many um, circumstances there are fans with very specific expectations 
for the game universe. So you can't decide whether you name uh, one character in this or that way. So it already has been decided. And um, if we now look at some specific um, features of game or video game translation, we have uh, two types of games. Those that demand more research than creativity, perhaps in a certain historic field, and others which demand more creativity than research. And uh, we heard uh, early in the afternoon when Stefan Schlechtweg uh, told us um, some scenarios of game design that we have to do as well with invented words. And you can't look in a dictionary how this is um, translated in a given language. So you have to invent to be creative um, as well. And in uh, many fields, you, or the challenge is to understand the jargon uh, used and to look for something which is equivalent in your target language. And uh, there you have to render it with a particular terminology for the given locale you are working with. And we heard that glossaries nowadays are something which are play an important role, so one has to prepare a glossary Style guides are used, uh, and um, we have often to do, it was a very nice uh, example, we heard as well with the audio, uh, with limited space and length of text fields, as well on the written as on the audio um, side. And uh, for instance, the example I uh, um, cho have chosen here is, this is rather difficult for a gamer to um, um, get what is meant here because every word that is, has been abbreviated, so you have really to be in this uh, game world to have an idea what things mean. So this is something which really is not very um, adapted to um, the audience and it doesn't fulfill um, usability um, of a game. So something I took from Daniel Stein, I, I believe you learned him, had, did you? Yes. Uh, who once was working for a um, game localization company as well. And um, he um, sketched some terminological challenges. So for instance, in a Casual game um, out of which this example is taken. Uh, you have a variety of bottles, but um, then you have the difficulty to look for equivalents for target language uh, solutions for each of those different bottles. And how do you proceed in such a case? And what he um, propose is to look, so you have a concept, so there's the bottle here, and you have to decide um, upon um, the task in which each of this concept, in which each bottle is um, used, so that you have a kind of um, decision help for your target language um, equivalent. And um, Another terminological challenge is um, shown here. So you have, this is um, a fact in other domains as well, you have divergent concepts eventually in different languages. Here, for instance, it's the concept of a steering wheel. And I put here both small images because the steering wheel in um, English is as well um, a steering wheel for a ship or an automobile and you have <coughs> to give additional information to make clear for which domain um, the term is used in the game. So when we talk about translatable assets, so what has to be translated? We heard a number of things already. So um, you have the website where uh, the game is promoted or where you find the game. 
to be downloaded. You have the packaging, so the game's box, for instance. In many cases, a uh, manual, sometimes a new functional one, but in other cases um, where the history is um, uh, told, so like uh, a kind of fairy tale book, then you have the, the software itself, so the game software, with readme files, with the dialogues for, or a dialogue for dubbing, another one for subtitling, you have the user interface, and graphics um, with different text layers. So this is something we didn't really talk about so much <coughs> this afternoon. So good video games uh, have uh, really complex graphics, and in many of those graphical items you have texts. And um, the question of internationalization here is if the <coughs> designer um, had thought about putting the text on different layers or, or if he had hard-coded um, the text, then it comes out to be a problem or a question of redesigning the graphic. So, if I talk about text and code, then for the translator, one of the challenges is um, text fragmentation. So sometimes you have a kind of cryptic game source code. And um, in a game you have linguistic assets that have to be extracted. And uh, they finally have to be transformed in a format that is useful for all parties, that is for the developer and for the localizers, because uh, after you have localized the text, it has to be re-imported into the <coughs> game um, environment. So, um, in this context, one of the biggest problems for the translation is uh, that translatable strings often incorporate variables. So, these variables express either name, or may express name, gender, nationality, and these are um, features that are not expressed in all languages the same way. And um, if we have a look at variables, for instance, one should, as a developer, avoid things like, here for instance, uh, slash n, name of nation, is attacking you. Then if you think of examples like Rome is attacking you, this doesn't, um, isn't a problem, but if you have a plural at this place, for instance, the Vikings, so the entire phrase is grammatically wrong, and um, this has to be um, thought of when um, writing the text um, at an initial phase. So, Instead, you could use, for instance, as a, um, a texter for uh, a game, you are being attacked by, and then this final position in many languages is less problematic than the one we uh, saw at the beginning. So you are being attacked by, and then either the singular or the plural. Other um, problems arise when you have to do with concatenated strings. This is something as well very problematic when you use cat tools because often the concatenation breaks are breaks for your segments and um, you have a kind of puzzle in your uh, cat tool translation memory. So um, let's imagine that um, a kind of concatenation is used in order to generate a newspaper headline. And um, if this, for instance, is uh, formed like, uh, or with um, adjective noun, and then some kind of um, fixed form, from, and then band, at, so you have different um, positions where the text may vary, but um, this may be correct in English, for instance, but may uh, provoke enormous problems in French or 
in German and other languages. So here really is a need for internationalization and there the developers need to be aware of this problem and the, the task of the localizer, if he, he or she has this opportunity, is to make people sensible or to make them aware of these kinds of problems. So another point of internationalization that is important here is um, in a game, uh, or a game has to be coded in a way that it enables implementation of regional standards. So if you have time or dates, for instance, they have to be uh, correctly um, shown in the locale in which you play. And um, another thing where we have a lack of internationalization is, for instance, here we see an example of a hard-coded string. So we have uh, the text directly in the code, and this is a really a problem for the localization process because everything has to be um, extracted separately and um, re-imported into um, the code. So. One thing to identify in an early stage um, hard-coded strings or the, the way whether you or in which extent you can localize a game is pseudo-localization. And the tools we have now available or which are available, um, catch tools and localization tools, they have specific functions um, for pseudo-localization which um, enable us to identify those positions and then we have to communicate this to the developers and um, so that these problems can be um, taken away at, well, let's say, an early stage. But in each case, they um, um, lead to a point that time, that is time consuming because, because things have to be redone, which should have or could have uh, be done in a better way. So, if we think of technical prerequisites, we already heard today that Excel files are often used in this context. I added here text files, because in our context of the LogGem um, contest, we will have to do with text files. Sometimes RTF files are as well translated, sometimes even docs. Um, XML is used in the uh, game localization process as well, as we heard. I didn't mention HTML, but you mentioned it earlier today. And one format which perhaps seldomly is used so far, but which I suppose will play a more and more important role is XLIF, because it's a kind of way to exchange data between the localizer and the developer in a more easy way. So what we um, can uh, see so far that uh, concerning tools and um, developing, developing environments, there is a lack of standards in tools and formats. And um, there is not really uh, a tool for uh, localizing a video game. We heard from um, Karin that uh, MemoQ now is rather well equipped for some tasks of game localization, um, but this is more or less a starting point. So, um, CAD tools are prepared for documentation, for technical documentation. Um, very few tools um, support multilingual files, and we could see that um, there is a preview to other languages. This is very helpful, um, especially if you have multilingual Excel spreadsheets. So, if you remember well, if you normally um, take a document, it is overwritten in your CAD tool, but this isn't something you can use in this environment where you have several languages and you wish to add a localized version 
um, of your game. So spreadsheets are used and nowadays hatch tools are imperative in this field um, because on the one hand they are a kind of productivity boost but they are really um, the basis for terminological consistency. And um, if we have a look at tools, so if we heard, well, um, good game uses um, a tool, perhaps a proprietary tool, there are um, many of them in uh, several environments. Microsoft as well uses uh, an inside tool. Um, that localizers have to use, but which you can't purchase on, on the market. Um, we have a spreadsheet for glossaries, and uh, often we have um, special conversion tools, which um, can, uh, with which you can um, put the format of the spreadsheet into the one needed in the terminological database. And then in some contexts where you have to work together with others, you uh, work with Google Docs to create, manage and share glossaries online. I don't know whether this is the case in one of your companies, but it happens to be. And um, the reason for which catch tools are used in game localization to, to speed up translation um, in order to control terminology and, of course, um, to assure the quality of the game, especially if you have um, um, updates and releases, so they have to be consistent with each other. Um, so I already mentioned the <laughs> in-house tool which is used by Microsoft, so Lock Studio, for instance, this is one of the tools used in this scene. Lock Direct is something more or less new. Um, it's really something which has a certain specialization already for game localization, a tool that is used online as well, and it's a kind of um, CMS um, that is, yes, you have features of a catch tool on the one hand, but uh, the predominant features are those of a content management tool. Then uh, <clears throat> you use these kind of tools as well for the, or not only for the translation, but already um, during the creation of text strings for the translator or for the original game. And um, it is used as well to control the import and export of text um, into the game and to transfer the text to the localizer. Then we have localization tools. Most of you um, know well as Asolo, for instance, and we heard already about machine translation, which sometimes is as well used in this domain, but as Karine already mentioned, um, there can't be a uh, machine translation uh, used without post-editing, so um, therefore sometimes we have specialized post-editing tools to um, work on the um, machine translation output. So the CAD tools we uh, use in this field are on the one hand desktop tools, but as we heard from good games, um, Nowadays, a number of cloud-based or server-based, web-based tools um, are uh, in use. So among the CAD tools, so this is a, a, a list with, which could be longer, we have, for instance, SDL Trado Studio or MemoQ with the features we heard about. And on the side of the localization tools, we can use as well Pasolo or Catalyst. And um, among the cloud-based solutions which uh, recently have uh, come up, something which I um, find rather uh, interesting is, for instance, e the ePoint localization platform or um, the cloud-based localization management platform 
which both have uh, special features for uh, game localization. Here, for instance, um, this is Transifex. So it looks like a localization environment um, as MemoQ or Tado Studio. So you have these tables and uh, percentages for your uh, matches. Um, but there are uh, special uh, video translation features that are very interesting uh, in the domain of uh, game localization. So we have really a, a help for subtitling in this field. Then I um, mention here as well MemoQ because of this, uh, its um, ability to um, show different languages, which could be helpful as reference languages. Um, in the morning we had a presentation of somebody who now finished her, her uh, master studies here, um, a young lady who worked about Scandinavian languages, and these are very similar. In these cases, a kind of preview of other translations is very helpful as well. So, if we have to process specific file formats, it's not so different in the game environment, in a game uh, environment compared to other software applications. So, CAD tools and localization tools in general support XML and text formats. Um, they normally, nowadays, um, have as well XLIF support. And in each case, you have to configure the parsers so that um, the text can be well analyzed and the translator afterwards um, really can concentrate on the text and has not to do with the uh, surrounding text and formatting information. So I uh, now want to invite you that we will have um, um, a look at what will happen at the end of February, in the last week of February, starting the 22nd of February to the 1st of March, there will be the Lockjam uh, contest. And um, in this um, contest, there will be a game that will be um, a kind of open source environment in which uh, the game will have been developed will be twine, that you can read here, and this is a storytelling environment. So it's a completely web-based game where you, can, or where you um, enter one uh, environment and can make decisions about where you go or what you do. And um, there is in uh, the beta phase, um, Karin already mentioned, there, the developers have um, um, launched or uploaded something with which one can uh, test um, the own localization uh, results. This is very helpful so that one can have an impression of what one has done or whether the uh, results really fit into um, the web environment. So, in this um, context, we have to do with something you can see over here, and we will, in a few minutes, um, examine a little nearer. Here, in this case, we have to do with text files, or with a text file, because each language has a separate text file, but all the text files have the same format. And the format of the text files which are used here in this environment um, is that they are numbered, so it's the ninth segment, the eighth one, and so on, and they have a, a certain format. So the, the organizers of the contest, they um, tell you that you can use Notepad, to do the localization or the translation, which is true, but uh, you are bare of all useful um, features.
features so you don't have a translation memory. If you really only use Notepad, you don't have glossary control. And therefore, um, it's one way to do the localization, but perhaps there is an easier or more comfortable, I'd even say, a more professional uh, environment in which uh, one could do um, the localization. Not necessarily, but there are already tools that support this work. So, <clears throat> if we um, now look at a certain tool, and we will in a few minutes um, have a look at Pasolo and the way we can um, do the localization with the Pasolo, the SDL Pasolo localization tool. In this case, one has to analyze first the strings. So you have to use Notepad just to get an impression of what the text uh, format is. And I um, pointed out one thing when, uh, which is very important in uh, these cases. One has to look for recurrent elements. So which are the, the strings, the parts that um, are recurrent in all those strings? And what you see here is those uh, double quotes here, then uh, a number which follows those quotes, a dot, another pair of double quotes, and then those two backslash n, backslash n, and any text. So this is something which varies from um, segment to segment. And then in this case, for instance, one segment fills several lines, and this is the normal case in this environment. And if you look at the end of the segment here, apparently it's the end of a line, but uh, we will see afterwards that perhaps the end of the line is not ne a necessary condition to um, configure the parser. So we have to look for a kind of pattern for the localization tool that is able to extract the text from the environment from which it is uh, taken. And um, this is just the point where uh, Martina and Isabel will have to leave us. And <laughs> it's as well the point we can move to our computer lab to test which possibilities we have. So have a nice way back. Thank you once again.